Second speaker today is Chris Linus, who is an Information Systems Architect at the NASA Goddard Earth Sciences Data and Information Services Center, or again, the Just Disk. Chris? Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Okay, while this is coming up, I just want to thank both Jennifer and Jim for uh, getting this workshop going. I'm really looking forward to interacting with the uh, Giovanni community. This, uh, this kind of interaction is actually very helpful for us as we proceed with uh, the development of Giovanni 4. Right into it then, I'm going to be talking about Giovanni 4, which we, we sometimes call the, the next generation, you know, a little homage to Star Trek there, I guess. Uh, I want to acknowledge a number of uh, people that helped both with the implementation of Giovanni and also in providing some examples that I'll show later on in the, uh, later on in the talk. Uh, so I'm going to give a brief overview of Giovanni, which is going to be uh, very familiar, I think, to many of you, but uh, I hope you'll bear with me because I want to set up some of the, uh, the later topics and perhaps some of the discussion. Um, I'll spend most of the time, however, talking about the new and notable features in Giovanni 4. Uh, and then hopefully we'll get to uh, a discussion that I think will be both interesting and beneficial to us. Now, lately uh, there's been a lot of talk, not just in the news, but actually in academic circles about big data. And so on a number of occasions I've actually talked about the role that Giovanni plays in the world of big data. And particularly with respect to this idea of there being two main phases in uh, projects that are involving big data. You know, unlike a project where you go out and you collect your own data set, you come back and process it, you know the data pretty well. But in the big data world, if you will, you often have to do a lot of exploration of that data just to figure out which data you are looking for. I mean, in fact, from that sense, uh, you know, Giovanni has really been doing big data since it was, uh, since it was begun as, at its inception. Um, and the uh, there's a lot of Vs you'll see people talk about in the, in the big data. One of them is uh, volume. That's one of the things that makes big data difficult. Um, and in the remote sensing case, uh, we actually have run into this problem in more than one uh, area. Uh, normally, you would, you would need to download the data as part of that exploratory data analysis. And we've got some of the products are up to a gigabyte. This makes it quite uh, cumbersome, uh, particularly in the exploratory phase. Um, and then ultimately, you'd like to be able to get some kind of a picture of what the data can tell you, which sometimes means uh, summarizing the data either over the globe, over a long time period, possibly even both. Um, and that's another aspect of that volume problem. Um, but there's also a variety problem. And in some cases, uh, this is actually more important than the volume issue. And that is that there's really quite a lot of data sets. Uh, over 2,000 data sets, I think, in one form or another in, in our archive over the years. And I think that within uh, or across all of EOS disks, I think there, that that number is in uh, five figures. Um, but a second aspect of that variety is that the data often come in a variety of formats. HDF4, HDF5, NetCDF, GRIB, binary. Um, and even within those formats, there are often differences in the, uh, in the structures, which means that you need to spend some time learning the format. And some of these formats you can actually only in, uh, interact with through either uh, pre-cut tools or an API. So that involves even more learning. Um, we also have cases where uh, data sets have more than 800 variables. In fact, the errors version 6 data and the MODIS collection, actually I think the MODIS collection uh, 51 data, both of those level 3 products uh, have more than 800 variables. And just navigating through that, uh, can be daunting. Um, and finally, when you get down to try to uh, make a picture out of it, make some kind of visualization, you know, a lot of the geolocation information is handled differently, particularly amongst the different formats. So it's one more thing you have to learn. Um, so you put all these together. There's actually an additional one I've added here, in quality, uh, which involves you know, knowing what the quality is, is studying up on, on the impact of quality, which you know, we touched on in the previous, uh, previous lecture there. Um, and so all of this also uh, is compounded by the fact that you're often doing this in an iterative phase. So you're not just doing this for a single data set. You have to do it with a, a number of data sets. Um, so Giovanni's original purpose 
was to provide a, a rapid exploration of these data sets in this exploratory data analysis phase, whereby you would not have to download all of the data. You would not have to write your own code before you could even get a, a look at the data. So Giovanni gives you all of this uh, capability on the server side, this sort of quick start exploratory data analysis. Um, it does the finding and the fetching. It prevents a, presents a user interface that makes it a little bit easier to navigate through the data, particularly when you're talking about looking at the individual variables within the data. Uh, it does some filtering, regridding, summarization, and finally visualization. And I have a, just a sample down there. And once you've gone through this exploratory data analysis and discovered you know, which variables, which data sets, what time periods, which spatial areas yeah, fit the needs of your project, you know, then you can go on to this main analysis phase where you select the data, analyze, drive conclusions, and publish. Uh, you know, often the, the so-called fun part of, of the research phase. And what Giovanni tries to do is it tries to get you to that phase faster. You know, hopefully in a matter of hours instead of a matter of weeks or months. Um, so now, with that in mind, um, I'm going to proceed to talk about uh, what's new in Giovanni. Um, let me just go back briefly. But do keep in mind this kind of dichotomy between the exploratory data analysis phase and the main analysis phase, because I want to come back and discuss that a little bit more um, at the end of this talk. All right, so now I'd like to move into some of the things that are new in Giovanni. Um, uh, first of all, with respect to Giovanni 3, Jim uh, talked about this a, a lot in the previous talk, this idea of an omnibus Giovanni portal, that's kind of the name we give it here, which is a portal that will include all of the data variables. Um, because it's sort of ironic that for an exploratory data analysis tool, currently you kind of have to know, you know which of the various Giovanni instances have the data that you're looking for. Uh, so we're trying to remove that ironic aspect by making it easier for you to uh, uh, look through the entire portal. I'll touch briefly on Federated Giovanni. Um, any of you going to AGU, I'll be giving a, an AGU uh, talk in one of the informatics session on that. A uh, little bit, actually I'll go through a kind of a pseudo demo of how you can explore variables within the new Giovanni 4 interface. Talk briefly about shareable reproducible URLs. And then some of the newest functions in Giovanni, uh, things like vector plot, seasonal analysis, and uh, shape cell based area averages. So I mentioned the omnibus portal. This is the idea that you can get to all the variables in one portal. Um, right now, we've still got only 220, but we're continuing to add them on a weekly basis. Um, and you know, one of the nice things about the current Giovanni portal is it already is spanning different missions, different time resolutions. In fact, different time resolutions was, was actually impossible with the Giovanni 3 architecture. Uh, it was built in so deeply. Uh, there is, so there is a caveat, although you can, you can see um, visual comparisons between different types of temporal resolutions, we don't yet support any mathematical comparisons because that would involve a time aggregation step that requires a little bit more uh, scientific investigation. Um, now, the fact that we've put or are putting all of these different variables into this omnibus portal also means that it puts a little bit more stress on the user interface. And so we've had to add a lot of navigational aids into Giovanni 4, which I will take you through in a, in a couple of slides. Uh, Jim did mention the Federated Giovanni. This is a recently funded project by the NASA Access Program, which is ongoing now. Um, and it's, uh, it's basically got um, four other DACs uh, cooperating with us, uh, collaborating with us, I should say, to develop a, a system whereby each of those DACs can field their own Giovanni. Or in some cases, like the LP DAC, they can manage their own data within another uh, Giovanni instance. Um, and uh, just to answer Thomas Maxwell's question, uh, right now, Giovanni is not yet open source. We've gone about halfway through the process, and we're now entering the, the second half of that open source release process. So definitely by the end, and hopefully before then, of this uh, Federated Giovanni uh, project, I expect the, uh, the software to be released open source. Um, and it also relies on a lot of external open source uh, software, project, or software uh, programs as well. So we do expect to get the eventual release of the source out to the community. 
Now, another thing that we're building in this Federated Giovanni uh, effort is a virtual machine, which essentially shrink wraps, gives you a shrink wrapped version of a, of a Giovanni, which can then be um, can then be uh, configured and populated, you know, as you wish. And that that virtual machine will be fielded by three of those other four DACs. And it's a, doing things as a virtual machine means that you can put them on a cluster, you can put them on an individual server, you can even uh, put them up in the cloud. Uh, so there's a lot of flexibility to how, how we'll be able to um, uh, deploy that Giovanni to other, uh, to other instances, I should say. Uh, now, you'll notice arrows going back and forth between all of those Giovanni instances, and the reason for that is that we also will be building in mechanisms by which you can import data. On, it's a kind of a peer-to-peer -peer system. You can import data from one Giovanni into another Giovanni. And so uh, an organization can basically tailor Giovanni instance to include you know, exactly the variables across the OS disk, for instance, that uh, that particular user community would be interested. Uh, so this is going to increase the availability of uh, data in Giovanni, and again, it's going to put more pressure on uh, that navigational interface to be able to support that. Uh, and here's an early result uh, where we're showing the MODIS NDVI obtained from uh, the LP DAC. I'm actually going to come back to this slide in one of the, in one of the later slides. This is the area of Texas, um, Arkansas, Oklahoma. Uh, here's another example from PODAC. Uh, this is from Jim Acker, who made this uh, using just a very nice palette, I must say. Uh, sea surface temperature from uh, the physical oceanog oceanography DAC. These are sort of pathfinder variables that we've been working on uh, to prove or to, to develop the software that it takes to uh, run these externally, external DAC provided variables through uh, the current Giovanni core. So now I'm going to take you on a quick sort of pseudo demo, the Giovanni 4 user interface. Uh, this is the new Giovanni interface. Um, and in order to be able to uh, navigate through this much, eventually much larger variable space, you can see this one's already got 219 variables in it. Um, and like I said, that is increasing weekly. Um, so we've added three key uh, uh, navigational aspects. On the on the left-hand side is a faceted browse, and this is basically the kind of uh, query refinement that you find in nearly any online shopping site today. So one of the things we've been able to do with the Giovanni 4 re-architecture is make it a more modern Giovanni and take advantage of some of the, the, the evolution of user interfaces over the past several years. Uh, there's also a search blank, which you can see um, you can see a search blank up here. Um, where you can type in any kind of keyword. And in fact, often, you know, you get folks that are more comfortable using that faceted browse and checking boxes to narrow things down, but other folks would just as soon type into that search blank exactly what they're looking for. And that will filter the table that you see down to um, uh, the auto, you know, down to what you've typed into that search blank. And then there are also sortable columns. Um, so if we move on to, uh, like I said, this is going to be a quick little demo. So this is what it starts off looking like. We, we still haven't really figured out what to put in that big blank space, whether we should have an example or an instruction on what to do next, or even try to list all of the variables, assuming that you're, you haven't uh, constrained them at all. Uh, and so any input from the user group on you know, which of those would be preferable uh, would certainly help us out. Um, so you start off this way. And uh, here's an example where I've done a keyword search on precipitation. You can see I've typed that into the, uh, into the search blank here, right down here. And then that filters the data in that uh, variable table down to just the data that have uh, some kind of keyword associated with precipitation. Uh, in, order to get, in order to clear that out and go back to doing the faceted search, which you know, actually my own preference is to, do, is to use the facet. Uh, I never seem to even think of the keyword search blank. Uh, you have other people that are completely the opposite. They'll never even think of using the facet, uh, but instead use the, the keyword search all the time. Um, so in this case, I've cleared it out to go back to the facet. Um, and now I've checked this uh, hydrology facet over here for the discipline. And that constrains it to all of the, uh, the data sets that we've assigned to that discipline. 
And actually, a data variable can belong to multiple disciplines. So if you don't find it in one, uh, hopefully you can find it in one of the others. Uh, one of the nice features about this, and again, this is based on what you see in the online shopping sites, is it will tell you how many matches there are for that particular item. So this, in ca for this case, we've got 16 hydrology data sets, and here you can see we're showing 16 data sets out of the 219 currently in there. Um, you can select more than one facet, and so what it will give you is basically the intersection of those. So in this case, we'll see only the hydrology data sets which are uh, precipitation-based. Um, now, when you select a, a particular variable for plotting, uh, we also try to help you out in the rest of the user interface. And so selecting that variable for plotting will lead us to, uh, let me show you here. So when you select this variable down here, the precipitation rate, it will give you this little hint up here to, uh, as to what the range is of possible start and end time. Um, and then lastly, you can also sort on columns. Now, we still have a little bit of work to do on some of the columns to make them uh, properly ordered, but the begin date and the end, la end date columns are, are particularly useful. If you're looking for data that's more recent or you're looking for data for, you know, with the longest time period uh, coverage, those columns can be quite useful. And the other thing it does is it helps put like data sets together uh, so that it's a little bit easier to compare them visually in that, uh, in that table. Uh, we also have some facets for spatial and temporal resolution. Uh, it's also very useful because that, that it's really, you're often looking for a particular uh, resolution for a given study. Now, one of the things that uh, is not immediately obvious, obvious, so that's why I've got a slide about it, is that as you go and select those various elements in the user interface, we actually modify the URL up in your browser. Um, and what that means is that that URL essentially describes the entire configuration as you've selected it uh, going through that process. Uh, so in this case, you can see the service pointing to our interactive map, also known as the time average map. Uh, you can see the time range reflected in the URL. You can see the bounding box. And then finally, you can see the data variable. And so this can be quite powerful because if you then reload that URL or send it to a colleague and have them load that URL, it will load the user interface as exactly as you had started it. Uh, and this actually has a lot of uh, very useful applications as you go, as you go forward. We've, we use it a lot for duplicating uh, test bugs, for instance. Um, but you can also essentially create a kind of a mini portal on the fly by selecting the things you're interested in, and then either bookmarking them, uh, placing that uh, URL into a, a website, for instance, or um, even, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, sending it to colleagues. Um, so what that does when you load that URL is it does not execute the workflow, but it'll put you in this uh, user interface with everything selected so that all you need to do is uh, hit the big green plot button in order to start the, uh, the workflow. And we do it this way so that if you want something that's almost like you know, that portal or that shared URL, but you want to tweak it a little bit before you go through the process, this allows you to you know, add more variables, change the bounding box slightly, add more constraints, or what have you. Um, we, have, we have a number of data comparison services. Uh, this is very often one of the key things you do in exploratory data analysis is try to figure out is this data set better than this data set? Or is, you know, what are the differences between this data set versus that data set? Uh, one of the most commonly used one is a correlation map where we compute the correlation between uh, the two variables at each grid cell and then plot that up as a map. Um, but we also have a difference of time average maps. So in this case, you're averaging two different variables over time. And then at the end of that process, you uh, subtract one from the other at each grid cell. And we've got two different kinds of scatter plots. Uh, well, in addition to the regular scatter plot, which just points each individual uh, data point from one variable against another, in, we've got two additional ones, one where we do an average over time for each grid cell and then plot each grid cell against each other. Uh, and another case, which is the complement of that, the area average scatter plot, where at each time step, we compute the area average of the boxes you've selected, 
And then at the very end, you know, plot a scatter plot of uh, the values at each time step. And then another one is a time series of differences of area averages. And I'm getting a little low on time, so I, that one takes a little while to explain. I, I think I'll, I'll move on to the, the rest of the talk here. Uh, here's a quick example of a correlation map. Uh, so one of the things I like to do, actually, when we get a new version of a data set in, is to see, you know, where does that new data set differ and hopefully improve on the previous data set. And so what you like to see is you like to see it be mostly the same, but on the other hand, if it were exactly the same, then you'd have to ask what's, what's the good of the new reprocessing. Uh, so the correlation map is particularly good for that because it will show you areas. For instance, here you can see some areas off the, the west coast of South America, the west coast of Africa, the west coast of the U.S. where there's some significant differences between uh, version 6 and version 7 trim. Uh, here's another of those. Uh, this is the difference of time average maps. This is from one of our test modes, and it shows uh, a soil moisture product, LPRM, computed from the X band versus the C band. And it turns out that the LPRM from the X band is more affected by vegetation. So here we're looking at Texas. You can see that those uh, sparsely vegetated areas in central and western Texas, there's virtually no difference. Whereas if you look at um, Arkansas to the east, you can see some very significant differences uh, between the one and the other. And in fact, if we look at that modus NDVI I showed you before, you can see that that's also the area where the vegetation gets quite dense. So again, this shows you, you know, the, the effect of that uh, different uh, vegetation index on, or, or rather, vegetation density on the, the uh, LPRM soil moisture. Um, and so this is also pointing out one of the powerful uh, features that we hope to have with Federated Giovanni is the ability to bring together two data sets like this from two different sources, uh, kind of over two different disciplines to a certain degree. Um, we have some brand new services I want to go over. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time on them, um, but I do want to at least make you aware of them. One is vector plots for wind-type products. Uh, we've got uh, a couple of uh, really interesting new seasonal analysis capabilities. And then the most recent one, which will be coming with the next version of Giovanni, I think to be installed this week, uh, which is shapefile-based area average time series. So vector plots are related, available for some wind-related variables. We've only got a couple in there now, but as we add more of the MARA data sets, we'll get many more of those wind variables. Um, it's currently only available for the time average map service, and the way that we do it is we, we compute the average of the U vector and the V vector, and then we uh, uh, compute the vector magnitude and direction from those time averages of U and V. And so here's an example of December 1997 versus December 2000, one in El Nino year and another uh, La Nino year for um, wind stress uh, magnitude. Or actually, this is the wind stress vector, I should say. Uh, I mentioned the seasonal analyses. Uh, this was suggested by several users, uh, and uh, we put two seasonal analysis capabilities in there. One, we're calling a user-defined climatology uh, because, strictly speaking, you know, some of the fields think a climatology has to be you know, on the order of 30 years to be truly climatology. So we're, we're fuzzing the definition a little bit here. But basically what this allows you to do is compute the climatology over the period and months or seasons of your choice and the variables of your choice, uh, although it's available only for monthly data currently. Uh, so you can aggregate by month or aggregate by meteorological season. And here's an example of uh, MODIS monthly AOD for March versus for September over uh, the 2001 to 2013 uh, time, frame, time uh, range. Um, in some of these cases where this service already exists in ops, in, in our operations mode, I've also added a URL that when these are, are hosted, uh, you'll be able to click on that URL to repeat that, uh, th the same workflow that I ran to get that. Uh, the second seasonal uh, capability is interannual time series, again, available for monthly data. And so what this allows you to plot is the area average, the average over the, the time area uh, that you're looking at. Um, and it allows you to plot that time average for a given number of years from start to end. 
Uh, so here's an example of an interannual time series. Uh, this is going from 2003 to 2013 and showing some strong summer warming in the area of the uh, Siberian uh, uh, tundra region. So this, this is an example of some errors data, by the way. I know there was a question in the, in the previous uh, talk section. Uh, I mentioned we also have support for shape files. And so what we support currently is the ability to uh, compute an area average time series not over just a bounding box, but now over uh, a shape. Uh, soon we'll actually have also a time average map version of this as well as a histogram version. Uh, there's uh, one limitation is we have not been able to get it to work across the date line. So I'm sorry if you're, if you're working on Russia or Alaska. Those are, are not going to work quite properly just yet. Um, this is an example of how we do this, actually, is we uh, take the shape and we burn it in using the, the Google library. Um, and around the borders, what we do is we compute the percentage of a grid cell that's covered by the shape. And so that allows us to do a weighted average uh, for that area average that includes, you know, how much of the borders are really covered uh, by, that particular, uh, by that particular shape. Here's an example showing Hurricane Sandy over the Dominican Republic. Uh, so you can see the, uh, how much trim rainfall we had um, over the entire uh, shape, or in this case, the entire country of the Dominican Republic. Uh, here's a second example where we've computed over time, actually over several years, the, uh, a comparison of modus terra monthly aerosol optical depths over the U.S. versus over China. Um, I did want to mention one other improvement in Giovanni 4 over Giovanni 3, and that is performance. Uh, so we, again, going back to this idea of having an exploratory data system, Basically, getting better performance allows you not only to perform faster, but also to uh, look at much larger swaths of data, if you will. Uh, and so for, this is showing the, the relative performance of G4 versus G3. Uh, in the time average map, we actually get more than an order of magnitude improvement. Um, and even in the area average time series, we're still getting uh, over a factor of three. Um, and the other thing I want to mention is that the Giovanni 4 curves tend to be more or less linear based on how much you're doing, but because of the software we use in G3, those are almost exponential. And so the more data you get, the slower and slower and slower it goes. Um, and at this point, I want to go to a couple of slides that I hope to motivate uh, some discussion. Uh, first slide is we still have a lot of features on the to-do list. Uh, we've tried to do the features kind of in the order of the popularity that uh, the users, or rather the usefulness for the users, and this also goes for the data. And so that's why we have you know, the most popular features are actually time average map and area average time series. That's why those are already in uh, Giovanni 4, along with a host of other uh, relatively popular um, uh, services. Um, so we still, however, have a lot of features on the to-do list, um, some of them a little less popular, but I know that there are uh, communities out there that need them. The trick is if we could get some gauge of how much support there is for some of these properties, it would help us prioritize this list. Uh, right now, we're actually working on pre-computed climatologies. So these are climatologies computed either by the science team or by us beforehand. Uh, we're looking at uh, adding OMI level 2G in the not too distant future. That's actually a very large and difficult to implement feature, as well as level 2 data support, which we know has been requested by a lot of people and exists to a limited degree in Giovanni 3. Uh, cross sections, uh, both Z latitude, Z versus longitude, Z versus time, uh, as well as arbitrary cross sections. Uh, we've had what? <coughs> We've had one or two requests for time series area statistics. So I suspect that that one might be fairly popular, but again, we'd like to hear from the community. Uh, zonal mean is another one we haven't yet done. Uh, this is one that is perhaps more useful with some data sets than with other data sets. Uh, Multi-variable plots where we can overlay more than one time series on a plot or overlay wind vectors on uh, a contour plot 
or line contours on a color slice. Um, you know, any, again, you know, if, if those are really useful for you, let us know. Uh, some people actually like to write applications or scripts against Giovanni. And so in the previous Giovanni, we had a not so well documented machine interface called Web Coverage Service uh, that we have not yet implemented on, on Giovanni 4 yet. Uh, we've always had this concept. I think, I think Greg originated, originated this years and years ago, but we've never quite gotten around to doing it because it is somewhat hard. This concept of My Giovanni, which has user contributed color palettes, shape files, data, algorithms, basically any component of Giovanni that I've been showing, you know, we'd like to somehow support the ability of users to contribute their own um, aspects to that. Uh, there's some variables which really should not be computed as an arithmetic mean because of the particular uh, distribution. Uh, I think ocean color falls into this category where geometric mean would be a better uh, representation of the data in its aggregation. Uh, units conversion, I know that's popular with some folks. We haven't gotten to that because it's much more complicated than it seems at, uh, on the surface. And then also more download options. Uh, recently we just had a request for a KMZ download option. More ASCII, currently you can get ASCII download only for the time series. Um, and then the ability to uh, download in batch. We actually have a, a secret feature that will be going into the new Giovanni uh, that does allow that uh, in, in some form. So if anyone's interested in that secret feature, before we have this up, you know, let me know. Um, and again, your input can help us prioritize them. Um, and now I want to go back to those first slides um, that I showed about Giovanni in its role as data uh, exploration. And that is the question, should Giovanni evolve to support the main analysis phase better? I mean, clearly it supports that main analysis phase. I mean, the very fact of this workshop and the talks we have in this workshop are showing that uh, at least a number of users are getting some really good capabilities out of that for that main analysis. But you know, the question is, is there anything that Giovanni could do better, particularly things that would enhance scientific rigor? Because as we develop Giovanni for exploratory data analysis, you know, we worry to a certain degree about the rigor. But on the other hand, you know, there's so many things we need to cover for the exploration aspect that we ha often have to make trade-offs. And so I'm kind of you know, putting it out there to the community is whether there are specific features, perhaps having to do with provenance or linking to you know, the original level two data or you know, whatever your ideas are that might help you, uh, again, you know, make your papers more defensible for reviewers, make you feel better about the answers you're putting in those papers, uh, basically, like I said, you know, enhancing that scientific rigor. And I think with that, I'll, I'll stop and turn it over to questions. Okay, thank you, Chris. We will now move to the uh, Q&A talk. And then what we'll do after that is we will move to a 15-minute break, maybe a little bit less depending on the, on the number of questions we receive right now. Okay, so the first question is actually somewhat, uh, let's see, long here, um, Chris. So, First question is, how can we correlate trim rainfall data versus MODIS NDVI and LST? As I have studied Indian summer monsoon rainfall for the year 2009 and 2013. The further um, uh, added comment is, the paper and accepted in International Journal of Earth Science, and, okay, excuse me. I have planned for continuous time series analysis of these data, evapotranspiration and soil moisture estimation. Which data sets shall I choose? And can you suggest to me any statistical algor algorithms to prove it? So uh, it's quite long. I do have it highlighted up there, Chris. I don't know um, if you can see. Uh, can you still hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So, um, so I'm an engineer, and I can't answer much of the science aspect of that. I mean, what I can say is that as we move forward with the federated Giovanni, we will eventually, probably I'm going to say, you know, beginning of next year, have some of that MODIS NDVI in the same Giovanni instance as the rainfall data. Um, and I think we can look at putting the LST in as well, because this kind of request is the kind of thing that helps us decide, you know, which variables to prioritize. 
Um, so right now, um, you couldn't do it within Giovanni, um, but uh, again, you know, at the beginning, of, towards the beginning of next year, um, this will be much more. This is exactly the kind of scenario that we'd like to uh, enable. Um, and I can't, I can't. I'm sorry, I can't help you with the statistical algorithms. I'll, I'll have to turn that over to uh, scientific colleagues. And 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 another added point um, for. Canabalon, I hope I pronounced your name properly, is that our MODIS MDVI data is distributed through our NASA land processes DAC. So I will um, insert the URL for that website into the, um, into the Q&A here so that you can take a look. And certainly if you contact their user services office, they would be able to point you to the most appropriate MDVI product for your research. Okay. And then I don't know, Jim Acker, if you had any comments regarding the trim, um, the correlation question. You still on, Jim? I can't hear you. You'll have to do star six. Oh, okay. He's not uh, on the telephone at the moment. Okay. And then the next question, Chris, is did I hear you say that Giovanni 4 will be eventually will eventually be open source. And what's the schedule for that? <laughs> so the answer is yes. It will definitely be eventually open source. Um, but as you may be aware, you know, taking things through an open source release process within NASA has some unpredictable aspects to it schedule-wise. Um, so I intend to submit all of the paperwork probably within the next couple of weeks. Like I said, we've gotten halfway through with our new technology report. Uh, being submitted. But now I need to go through the, the next phase of that and how long that takes honestly depends on the lawyers and you know what they find. Okay, thank you, Chris. Any additional questions? Let's see here. I'm just scrolling down to determine whether or not there are further questions. If you have a question, please do type that into the Q&A pod here. Any questions, anybody? OK. Um, let's move to the next question. My study area is semi-arid region in India, which, uh, OK. Which data sets shall I compare for correlation and Giovanni 4 data sets if clear data? Shall I compare trim rainfall level Trim level, OK, this is a little bit, OK, excuse me, trim rainfall, 2, LST, 3, NDVI, 4, question mark. Um, you know what I think we probably need to do for this is I think we need to capture this question and send it to our help desk to route it to our, our science experts in this area. Yes. And so um, the Q&A log, Chris, will have this individual's email address. So I think what we'll do is we'll follow up with you offline with a more specific answer to your research question. OK? And then Jim Acker has a, a question for you, Chris. Chris, what is the best way to provide input on the prioritization? Um, so you know, we'll take input in practically any form. So even just an email to our help desk is, uh, is sufficient. In Giovanni 4, there is a feedback button. And uh, if you click that button, it'll bring up an email. It'll say error report in the, uh, in the uh, subject line, but you can change that to be anything you like. And, and the nice thing about that is it, it, it uh, includes what you were trying to do at the time in terms of what your selections were. So if you have something that's very specific, using the feedback button is a little bit better than email. But otherwise, you know, email our help desk is, is just fine. And so users can access this feedback bu button by, um, by way of being on the Giovanni site. Do you have it linked there or on the Goddard DAC homepage? Uh, it's in the Giovanni 4 user interface. OK, uh, perfect. Thank you very much, Chris. Any further questions? I'm not seeing any further questions. If you have a question, uh, let's see. Next question, I've got a couple. Can you publish the list of priorities? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Um, yeah, I think so. But, but those priorities, frankly, are kind of owned by our local scientists. And so I think I want to talk to them 
about how they might want to do that uh, publication. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, any further questions? Anybody? Don't be shy. Okay, general comment. The work you are doing is great as Giovanni is an extremely useful tool for users applying Earth observation data. Uh, thank you very much. We appreciate and then, the comment as well. All right. And then let's see, the next comment and, and question. I'm aware that much of NASA data assimilation products focuses more on atmospheric studies. Since I live in the Philippines, and for the most part of the year, we deal with some of the most extreme weather events the last decade, how do you think Giovanni 4 aids our knowledge based on potentially devastating storms? So how can Giovanni contribute toward um, you know, perhaps mitigating uh, some of these events? Um, boy, I mean, that's, that's a question to an entire research community, I would say. Um, so anything that we can do in Giovanni to help those researchers uh, work on those atmospheric studies, and particularly the ones with respect to the extreme weather events, uh, I think is helpful. Now, of course, this does get back a little bit to, you know, how much of Giovanni should be targeting exploratory data analysis and how much should be targeting the actual science analysis that uh, you use in that main phase. Uh, so, uh, you know, what, what we can do is continue to provide, I think, the, the best service we can in terms of uh, availability, availability of data and, um, and services. And further than that, we need the input from the community to tell us what's going to help them on that research the most. Okay, thank you, Chris. All right, so I see that um, Jim Acker is actually uh, providing an answer to that user, Adonis, uh, so if you stand by for a moment. And then the next question is, how can Giovanni contribute to the climate study in peninsular India as we in India experience different climatic conditions? Shall I consider SST and its influence on LST? Um, so the, here's an area where I think our move to Giovanni 4 and particularly Federated Giovanni is going to help out in this because, um, you know, in the past we've, we've only dealt with SST from time to time as kind of an external side project, but now that we have uh, the Physical Oceanography DAC, part of Federated Giovanni, um, once we get that SST in there and up and running on, a, on an operational basis, uh, I think that'll help. And in fact, you know, the scenario that we used uh, to get the funding was one of these coastal scenarios that was looking at a variety of uh, parameters, both um, surf, uh, ocean surface as well as land surface. So I'm really hopeful that uh, the Federated Giovanni, once it's up and operational, will enable this kind of multidisciplinary uh, study uh, to be much, done much more easily. Okay, thank you, Chris. And I am looking for further questions. Um, we've got just a minute or so left to this portion of the workshop, and then we will take a 15-minute break. Any further questions? Okay. If there are no further questions, then we will move to a 15-minute break. Um, note that I will be stepping away from the telephone just for a, a brief moment. The room will still stay open. I wanted to point out to all participants that the presentation file for Chris is listed below. If you are interested in downloading it, you would highlight the file. It will then prompt you to download. And um, the same will be true for Jim Acker's presentations. I've actually uploaded all of his presentations, um, you know, after the break, you will be able to download the first presentation this morning as well as the second after his talk. And you are very welcome. Okay, so what we'll do now is we'll move to the break and we will um, you know, touch base again in 15 minutes. If you have questions, feel free to continue to enter them into the Q&A pod. Okay?